This is our pro podcast for the 2020 election campaign. I'm Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Regina Leader Post, and joining me are Arthur White uh, Crummy from the Leader Post, who covers the legislature and will be covering this uh, election, and from the Star Phoenix, Phil Tank, who uh, will also be joining us on the campaign. And this is something new that we're going to try today to give you some good background in terms of the election, have some fun with a campaign, thus the name Campaigniacs. Uh, I guess the best place to start today, guys, would be the news, because uh, that's what we do. Our, uh, Bill, your story on the poll in relation to the numbers, there's a tremendous number of people who aren't saying, who aren't who are undecided, uh, and uh, obviously, that limits what the poll can tell us or what we can gain from it. But what did you gain from it in terms of, of stuff that surprised you or, or that you thought was most interesting at this particular point as we head into election? I think well, it'll be called a week or two. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, uh, the number of undecideds was striking, but so was the, the continued lead of the SAS party over the NDP, basically two to one. If you break that down to decided voters, it's 50 some percent compared to, you know, 25%. So uh, it's kind of reflects what we've seen in other polls. Um, you know, two, two new leaders facing, uh, facing election with their parties for the first time. Um, you know, we saw kind of oddly that 60% uh, of the people said COVID-19 issues would, would uh, be important in how they vote. Uh, but also um, that 60% uh, or, you know, again, uh, uh, about two thirds said, that the back to school plan won't play a role in how they vote, which is kind of interesting. That was I mean, the interesting, poll was taken yeah. before people actually went back to school, so we didn't see the positive cases uh, in schools. Uh, did they offer any explanation as to uh, how much of an outrider it is to have 40% not saying or undecided? Because really, that's kind of how many people don't vote in elections in this province. And from that sense, I wonder about uh, whether it, it's as inaccurate as maybe some people might think it is with that many undecided. It was a small sampling of 400, uh, so the margin of error is going to be slightly larger than if it was, say, a thousand poll, a uh, thousand people polled in, in Saskatchewan. But was there any thoughts given as to uh, uh, whether they lack confidence in the accuracy of that because of that number, Phil? No, they didn't really uh, uh, get into that. Uh, it's a good point, of course. Yeah, we know uh, where the uh, the unfortunately the uh, the low uh, voter turnout has sort of settled here. And uh, you know, of course, COVID nineteen, as we know in every election, we, we look to the states and everywhere else, could affect turnout. You know, um, we don't know. You know, this is going to be a late October election. It, uh, you know, who knows what the situation is going to be. I'm not sure that a lot of people, I, mean, I could be wrong here, but I'm not sure that a lot of people have, um, you know, arranged to vote yet or are voting by mail or, or you know, so advance polls will be interesting. Uh, election day will be interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's also I, I truly very do wonder, it's, it's interesting, I truly do wonder whether this might actually increase the enthusiasm uh, in some ways because, those that don't want the SAS party to have to win or to have a, a majority. Arthur, we're going to get into why the NDP probably can't win uh, right away. But uh, either one of you guys, it, it, is it possible that seeing the numbers as they are would be the final wake up call for anybody that's not necessarily uh, uh, hardcore New Democrat, but just struggling with the government for whatever reason to be more motiv mo motivated to uh, to vote. Certainly, if you're the NDP and you see a poll like that, what else can you do other than use that as a tool to motivate uh, people out to the polls at this particular point? I can jump in on that, Murray. And I feel like uh, your column today, even with the headline, gives a sense of how unrealistic that might be. Because if people genuinely feel like the NDP's chances are hopeless and it's not a competitive election, then it might seem less pressing to actually get out there and make the difference. I mean, we always see that in elections that seem close, where the margin really seems to be hanging in the wind, that people are that much more motivated to jump in there and try to make the difference. If people feel that it's going to be a blowout, then they might have that much reason, that much more reason to stay home. And we might see the same kind of low turnout numbers that we've seen in the past. Yeah, that, that could be. I, I'm very glad we did what we did today, and we'll, we'll get into it 
in detail uh, as to how it may or may not affect the campaign. But uh, too often I've seen elections covered and judging by these gray hair, I can't believe I'm so much grayer than you guys. That, that's sad about the, uh, the visuals in this podcast. Having covered this, most Saskatchewan elections aren't close. There is these wild swings back and forth between the NDP and the non-NDP alternative. And we saw even in 82 and, and 91 when we had the big swings. This is a bit of an anomaly where you're actually seeing one, uh, at least in my lifetime, where you see one party settle in to a very strong base. What we don't do well or what we haven't adjusted to doing well is really telling the story of how much influence that has on the actual campaign. With those 29 rural seats, 31 of them is identified in uh, in uh, in your story in my column today that basically the SAS party won by 2,500 votes. The NDP doesn't have a chance of winning. They just uh, are, are basically no chance. Can you sort of explain why that's the case, Arthur, the people that still don't get that? Well, okay. Stranger things have happened, and uh, yes. you know, election campaigns can can be uh, messy, and there can be all sorts of turns around the road, and we never know what kinds of events are going to jump in and completely uh, change the dynamic. But if we're simply looking at what the past can tell us about the future, the 2016 results uh, do not bode well for the NDP's chances, particularly when we look. Uh, at 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 the uh, vote gaps in the ridings that they would need to win to take government. So they have 13 seats now once the uh, legislature is dissolved. Uh, they need to win 18 more to take a bare majority. Um, the first 10 or so are not, some of them are tough, but they're contested. Like we're talking about seats where the SAS party won by less than a thousand votes in 2016. But once you get to number 11, the jump is significant. Regina Gardner Park, which is number 11 that they would need to take if we're counting up from the bottom to the top, the SAS party won by 1800 votes in 2016. And once we get up to number uh, 17 and 18 on their target list, so the seats they would need to add to their total to get over the top, we're looking at vote gaps that are over 2,500 votes from 2016. And we looked at the historical precedent here and it's almost never happened. There are six examples. And of course, Murray, you you, you were no doubt around in 1934. And I'm sure that you remember when social credit did that. And it's only happened five times after that. So yeah. the NDP is needing some uh, uh, historically rare turns in order to take uh, government here. And this is not the kind of gap that you can make up just by good organization and a sound campaign strategy. Like they really need to hope for an act of God yeah. to really come into the campaign and completely throw the cards up in the air. And Phil's polling results that he took a close look at show that the reality right now is not altogether that different from 2016. So we're going to have to see some pretty major movement yeah. pretty fast. I think yeah. what since go ahead, Phil. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think what's interesting is that I think there was a lot of people who thought the SAS party rode to huge victories because of the popularity of Brad Wall. This is the first election yeah, uh, since he point. went in 2007 that he's not there. I don't think Scott Moe is really uh, sets off the charisma meter, and I don't think Ryan Miley does either. Uh, so it seems to be settling into support of uh, the parties. I found it interesting this week that we saw a poll from Alberta that showed the NDP tied with the United Conservative Party mm -hmm. there. You know, so like it seems like what used to be Canada's most predictable political province in Alberta has now become pretty unpredictable. Saskatchewan, on the other hand, looks like it has yeah, settled into a very predictable pattern. What's your, what's your sense there? What's working for Scott Moe that's right now not working for Jason Kenney beyond the fact the economy in Alberta is slightly worse right now because of their overall dependency on oil more so than us? Uh, has Sa uh, Saskatoon perhaps isn't quite as uh, immediately affected by the oil patch because it got so many other things going for it, for instance. What's working for Moe right now that that do you think, Phil, that that's really resonating in, in, in that way with voters that maybe isn't res resonating elsewhere in other provinces? Well, I think in Alberta that uh, there's a sense that Jason Kenney is personally unpopular. So that might be driving that because ge generally yeah. we saw in New Brunswick 
the New Brunswick collection this week as someone who, you know, really looked like they were uh, calling a snap election to take advantage of, uh, of popularity during the pandemic. You know, of course, they were in a minority, the progressive conservatives there, and they won a majority. So, uh, you know, uh, this, of course, election has been uh, has been on this schedule for a while. Scott Moore obviously wanted to call it in um, in, uh, in, in the spring uh, in April. Um, and I think I think it's March, probably guys, been March. his. It's been too long. <laughs> <laughs> the vote would have been in April. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the call would have been in March. Fine. The call yeah. would have been in March. <laughs> which think about it in the terms of the pandemic pandemic, Phil. Sorry for my words. Like it, it, it's. Like it's bizarre. I, I honestly sometimes wonder why none of this has ever stuck to Mo, including in your poll today related in your poll story today related to the pandemic. It's really not resonating as much as I thought it might be. Well, yeah, and 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 I've observed that you know he spent a lot of time uh, in these pandemic briefings. If you look at especially the other Western Canadian premiers, you've barely seen them at them. Even even Kenny, you know, again possibly because he's unpopular, isn't really at the pandemic <laughs> briefings. Uh, Scott Moe has been front and center throughout the whole, uh, the whole uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, in early, in early days, he was crowing about our testing rates and how we'd flatten the curve. You know, obviously less of that now because our testing rates are pretty poor per, on a per capita basis compared to the rest of Canada. Uh, but I, I think, you know, I think, there's, I think there's a sense that, we tr you know, people want to trust whoever's in charge, the federal liberals, uh, you know, uh, benefited from that. Briefly, Donald Trump and the states even benefited from that. So uh, there's that at play right now, too. And, and we have done better on the pandemic numbers. Where do you think it works for, you, for the NDP in terms of at least picking up a few seats? And what I guess I'm talking about is both issues and specific writings, guys. Uh, obviously, education is something they've hammered on repeatedly, and the, ha and the SAS party has struggled with its uh, uh, school reopening plan. I kind of took three cracks at it before it kind of got it right. And I, I think legitimately teachers can argue and school dis districts can argue that they are the ones that have actually made it happen and work as well as, as it did as per what you guys talked about yesterday. Uh, where is that might all that translate into some level of success uh, for the NDP that we might not otherwise be seeing, according to you know the historic numbers that you, that, you, that we talked about, Arthur, or the polling numbers that we talked about, Bill. Where oh, I guess I'll start with you, Arthur. Where, where uh, in southern Saskatchewan, Regina area, do you think the NDP can actually still make uh, some gains? Well, it's clear that they're uh, that, that that that's where they need to target, just from the sheer uh, mathematics of where they have a shot at winning. And it seems to me as though they're choosing the right issues to attract the voters that they need to attract. Uh, when I've spoken to NDP staffers, we hear they want to uh, go after women voters, they want to go after multicultural groups, they want to go after indigenous voters. Those are where they see the chances to make gains. And uh, we've seen education, like you said, being a major point that they're hammering on over and over again, looking for any weakness in the Saskatchewan party's plans. If the numbers turn badly, I think that could be uh, a potential springboard for them into some of those suburban ridings. Um, but that, but uh, then again, so much depends on circumstances. Um, we're also seeing them uh, uh, making a lot of announcements about pocketbook issues, and we know that those play well with suburban voters. Uh, Ryan Miley, one of his first campaign announcements was an SGI rebate, right? Sending checks back to people from an SGI reserve. Uh, who would have expected that from the NDP before we got into this campaign? But making it about affordability is going to play a play potentially well with some of those um, suburban families that are facing the vice, particularly during Which the COVID-19 era. Are you, are you looking at, Arthur, and, and how does Wall Shakers, and uh, and for those unfamiliar, <laughs> I guess you, you can oh, debrief you a bit, but, but yeah, well, I, I'm just kind of wondering how much it's going to resonate throughout the whole city of Regina right now. Right. And whether so, so it's clear the ridings that they have to take in uh, Regina are going to be Regina Pasqua, Regina University, Regina Coronation Park, and Regina Welsh Acres. That's where they need to start. That's where the results were close in 2016. Those are, for the most part, older, established inner suburbs, uh, not the new outer suburbs uh, where we saw SAS party blowouts 
in 2016. And uh, so that's where they're going to have to target. But like you said, Walsh Acres is making it look like even running the board on those ridings might not be realistic. We have the NDP facing a bitter internal battle with their former candidate who was in place for 15 months before we should was before she was turf for unknown reasons. And we know that that's led, led to a lot of bitterness in the constituency um, association and with some of the volunteers. So with the SAS party having a candidate who's already out knocking doors and the NDP still trying to get their act together in Walsh Acres, it's not looking that promising in one of their must win seats in the city. I, I'm absolutely fascinated, Phil, help me here. Cause I'm just not, I don't have the working familiarity, not living in Saskatoon, but what is going on in Saskatoon Riversdale? Cause I keep hearing uh, the SAS party are targeting it in such a way that they think they can actually win it. And I also would love to know uh, or get a sense of what's going on in Miley's seat. And the SAS party has certainly made a target of or habit of always targeting, targeting uh, the NDP leader. And in 2011, 2016, they knocked him off through two for two. Are they going to go three for three with Miley? Uh, well, you know, it's certainly one of the seats that the, uh, they think, uh, they, they can win back. I mean, Miley won that fairly convincingly in a by-election, so he's yet to face uh, the uh, electorate in a, um, a general election. There's, uh, there's four vacant seats, you know, where uh, in Saskatoon. Three of them are, you know, uh, considered strong NDP ridings. So in addition to maybe taking uh, Saskatoon uh, Eastview, which was uh, Corey Toker's old riding, um, which uh, you know has obviously two new candidates for both parties uh, uh, running there. There's uh, you know the retirements of Kathy Sproul, Danielle Charche, and David Forbes, Saskatoon Centre, Saskatoon Nutana, and Saskatoon Riversdale. That you know the NDP has held. You know they've been traditionally been NDP seats. Those are seats they're going to want to hold on to and maybe add Saskatoon Eastview. The other one is Saskatoon University where uh, we're actually getting a rematch with uh, both candidates, Erica Lawson's the MLA there, and Jennifer Bowes uh, ran a fairly close race against him in 2016. So I, that's a seat that they're probably gonna want, I think it was about 300 votes or something like that difference. That's a seat they're, you know, they're going to want to try to win. Uh, Lawson has been a controversial figure for a backbench a former city councilor here too. So uh, th th that's how it's shaping up in Saskatoon. PA is a, Prince Albert is another uh, interesting area. Fairly close races in 2016. Uh, NDP won one, the SAS party won one. You know, Joe Hargraves now has now been uh, minister for a while, so uh, he's running again there. So that uh, always helps uh, the SAS party. Uh, I can't imagine that the NDP has given up on winning that seat though. <laughs> I asked this of Arthur before we have these stupid debates, uh, but we are campaigniacs, and this is the kind of things that we do talk about. Is it more likely the NDP picks up uh, five seats, or is it more likely they lose seats? What do you guys think? <laughs> if I had to bet, if I had to bet, and we've been over this before, I would say pick up five seats simply because the five seats that they would need to lose, like they would need to lose almost all of their contested ridings and be down to pretty much only their rock solid uh, safe seats, like the Northern seats, Saskatoon Center, Regina Elphinstone. Like th there's no chance that they're losing those seats. So the SAS party would pretty much have to run the board on the seats that are in play in order for the NDP to lose five seats whereas the NDP has a lot of options to pick up five. So yeah. it's really just because of the math and just because of the where we're starting from with the SAS party having such a commanding lead that, that I feel as though there's more room for the NDP to grow than shrink. It's funny because it, that we're even having this conversation tells us or tell, should tell people listening out there how far away the NDP actually are from power. And really for the third election in a row, this, uh, it seems to be this election has to be about establishing uh, a base for the next time around, making some gains, not just in seats, but in votes in critical areas so that you can uh, get over the hump in 2024, whenever the next yeah. election is. Uh, before we go on, uh, I, I want to talk about the pandemic, or, uh, Phil, and, uh, and 
uh, the next segment with your interviews with uh, uh, Dr. An Huang, An Huang. And please excuse me when I butcher this name, but Dr. Uh, Nazim Muhajirin. How'd I do on that, Phil? Not bad? Pretty good. I'm a print guy. Uh, what do you think the impact might be uh, from a pan pandemic point of view in relation to uh, getting vote out? Will it help one party or the other in uh, in your view? And, and what are uh, the various experts saying about, uh, about uh, uh, perhaps the issue at hand and whether this may or may not affect the vote? Well, uh, you know, one thing in the poll, when you when you dive a little deeper into the numbers, you know, older people tend to support the Saskatchewan party, younger people tend to support the NDP. And of course, we know that the older people are more at risk during the pandemic. We also know they're pretty, so they tend to be pretty reliable voters. So they may be, may be the ones who have already applied to vote for mail or, pl you know, plan to go on a uh, advanced poll day, uh, that sort of thing. So I, I think we kind of don't know. We've never, of course, you know, the Saskatchewan had elections in 1917 and I believe 1923. So we didn't have an election during the 1918. No, Arthur, I did not cover them. <laughs> <laughs> started in 38, right? Started 38, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> but, but it's true. Like, um, and we so, are, yeah, we don't really have, this is really an election like no other in, in history. And that's why we're doing things like this. And and we're going to move on to your next segment. Thanks so much, guys. Or we'll probably get together in a week or, or so and, and do this again. And maybe by that time the campaign will start. Maybe uh, not. But uh, but uh, I guess I'm looking forward to it. But uh, I guess that's reality. We've already started, Murray. Mo's on announcement number four this, or, uh, these past two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Feels like we've been campaigning already. Yeah, a lot of new, a lot of, a lot of new schools come. That's right. That's right. I'm going to one today. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all. Welcome back to Campaniacs. I'm here with Dr. Anne Huang, a former deputy medical health officer in Saskatchewan with a focus on communicable disease control and immunization, and Dr. Nazim Mujaharin, a professor of community health and epidemiology at the University of Saskatchewan. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the provincial government's response to the pandemic. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Uh, so what I'm going to start out with is I'm going to go back seven months. I know for a lot of us, it seems longer than that, to uh, March 12th. On March 12th, we uh, woke up thinking we were going to host the Junos in Saskatoon. We were expecting a spring election, and we had no um, uh, even presumptive COVID-19 cases, by the end of the day, the Junos were canceled, the election was called off, and um, and we had our first presumptive case. Uh, can you uh, think back to what you thought on that day? Or the early days of the pandemic? Let's, let's start with Dr. Huang. Uh, sure. Um, on March 12th, uh, I was relieved. Um, as you probably know, um, I became quite concerned at the possibility of uh, sudden spring elections in the midst of a pandemic um, that was just evolving. Um, and so I did um, write a brief open letter urging uh, the premier to reconsider um, his, um, to, to reconsider his, um, his options of holding the elections early. Um, and so I was very relieved to hear that um, there was that st that confirmation that a sudden election in the spring will not be called at that time, despite the fact that we had yet um, to record our first case in Saskatchewan when I wrote that open letter. And uh, Dr. Muhajirin? So I, I vividly remember uh, March 12th, uh, which was a Thursday. Um, I actually had this, I had CBC on, I think, uh, that morning <clears throat> when the news bulletin came, um, breaking news, uh, Junos is going to be canceled. Uh, it was actually the main event on the 15th was in, in three days time. Um, and it didn't surprise me at all that uh, the Junos was going to be canceled. Uh, the surprise was uh, why it took so long, why it even took uh, that many days uh, into that week 
uh, till Thursday uh, to decide that Juno's uh, was not the way to go, uh, uh, given what was happening around us. Uh, on the 11th of March, the day before, uh, on Wednesday, I wrote an uh, email to all the students in our program, um, telling them that uh, that WHO uh, had had announced, declared uh, this this was a pandemic, uh, you know, which was an upgrade from the earlier declaration uh, end of January uh, that there was a, a significant uh, outbreak of global significance by WHO, uh, which was a, a great lower than the outside outside pandemic. Uh, March 11th. So um, those two days seems many more months than seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking back right now. Um, and what, what followed then was uh, the uh, economic shutdown, like some businesses were told to shut down on certain dates, others on other dates and some were allowed to stay open. How do you think, what do you think of the way that was handled? You know, because we've heard, uh, we've probably heard a lot of different opinions on, on, on that uh, aspect of the pandemic response. I mean, I think the, the um, so, you know, I mean, things happened fairly quickly uh, uh, after that Thursday. So for example, on the 16th of March, uh, I think we heard that the schools were going to be um, closed down uh, gradually, but actually, you know, by that Thursday uh, of that week. Um, and I think it would it was another week or so before most of the businesses were uh, were really closing. Uh, the University of Saskatchewan uh, declared that their classes were going were suspended as of Monday, uh, the 16th of March. And then the week after the 24th, um, the, the university declared that they, they were moving to online uh, teaching and learning. And actually the buildings were, uh, were, were closed down for anybody. Um, so I think the business took, took a while, and, uh, but, but not, not weeks, obviously, uh, you know, very quickly. Um, but, you know, we were watching what was happening Canada, particularly in, uh, in, in bigger, uh, bigger provinces in Ontario and uh, Vancouver, but also BC actually at that time. Uh, and, and we knew that uh, the day has arrived in Saskatchewan uh, when our, the way we were living up to that point uh, was going to be changed. Um, and, and we are still in that change uh, seven, seven months in. I thought the initial um, response, um, which were very drastic and blunt measures to reduce social um, contact or physical, to, to increase physical distance um, and to break potential transmissions of COVID-19 were done really well. Um, I vividly remember that they took very decisive actions within that first week or two. Um, and I, I don't quite remember the staggering of sort of business closure, but I do recall um, a number of uh, decisions and policy actions were taken right away, um, which included um, essentially a lockdown of the, the long-term care sectors within Saskatchewan. So I think at the start of the pandemic, we were actually ahead on that front. Um, you know, without with with the first case being reported, the pandemic being declared, you know, I think all those factors kind of convalesced uh, into March 12th of the government saying, OK, we're not going to call a snap spring election. We need to cancel the Juno. Let's get to work on this. Um, and at that time, we really haven't you know, seen the evidence of transmission and outbreak in Saskatchewan yet. And um, I think at that point, um, it appears that the government was taking medical um, scientific advice um, quite seriously. And so we were ahead of other provinces that had already seen outbreak in long-term care. 
um, you know, in Ontario and BC. Um, yet we had more stringent uh, infection prevention control measures put in place. And I think that is um, a success story that um, needs to be, um, I, I think deserve to be kind of remember um, when, especially now people, you know, begin to wonder why all these restrictions are in place. It's important to remember that if we don't put things in place and, you know, preventively, then we will see, um, we will see the outbreak. Um, and so it's easy for people to, to forget um, all those measures that were taken resulted in, you know, where we are today in Saskatchewan and which is relatively well controlled um, epidemic in, in this province so far. And uh, what followed the shutdown was the reopening a couple months later. And, uh, you know, we certainly heard all sorts of opinions on it that it was too, or too, too, uh, too quick and too cautious. What did you think of the, uh, the gradual reopening plan of the province? I thought um, it was, it, when they announced that they were going to reopen, I think there was a lot of anxiety, um, rightly so, um, when, um, when it didn't seem like the uh, COVID-19 pandemic or epidemics in Canada was well under control. And, and when it seems like our cases were just rising, um, you know, um, but um, I think it was, it was actually uh, very well laid out in the sense that um, it did give people that expectations of how things might happen. And so that, that um, stepwise approach, um, I think was reassuring for the public to hear. And, and I think some of those details of how we go about ensuring safe opening um, and balancing um, the need to still keep some of the economic activities going and the need to ensure public safety um, was very well done. I think at that point, um, I think for Saskatchewan and, and when we compare it to the rest of the, the country, it appeared then, you know, um, the, the Saskatchewan's, uh, you know, first out of the gate seemed to have trigger all the other provinces to, to try to reopen as well. And, and some have more detail, but I think, you know, the, 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 in that approach initially, um, sort of laying out what the plans are and, you know, um, and I mean, they, they, they needed a bit of a prodding to clarify, you know, how and why, um, further reopening is still safe when they move on to the next phase. Um, but that kind of approach, you know, um, I think it's much better received than a reactive to a reaction, um, you know, to, to, to reopening the society. And so I, sorry, I ramble here a bit, but I <laughs> thought that was relatively um, well done as well at that point. Um. So it was May 4th, I think, uh, was the first day of the uh, Saskatchewan reopening uh, plan and, uh, and on to, uh, I think, about four or five phases. Uh, these, these dates are um, quite vivid in my mind because we launched a, a Saskatchewan-wide survey the same morning of May 4th as the reopening day, and, uh, and uh, which was... Um, well, it was designed to happen that way. Uh, and we were fortunate and, and uh, be able to do that. Um, like Dr. Huang was saying, I too uh, think that the reopening plan was uh, uh, one of the brighter spots uh, uh, of Saskatchewan's experience uh, with this pandemic, in the sense that uh, the government was uh, uh, clearly laid out a plan that had multiple phases separated by usually two to four weeks. Uh, and that makes sense why two to four weeks, uh, given what we know about the, uh, the virus and how, how it transmits from person to person. Um, for example, 14 days of isolation, you know, and that is, you know, uh, that we all know by now. And there's no, um, you know, there's no surprise that 14 days, 21 days or 28 days will be the uh, the time period in these uh, phases. 
um, I think phase one was very cautious, uh, you know, um, uh, just only, you know, uh, really grocery stores, I think, uh, essential work and, and a little bit more. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, I think May 18th uh, after the Victoria Day weekend uh, that even um, some personal services, uh, you know, were allowed, you know. So I think I think we had we have done that part quite well. Um, it was detailed, well laid out. I'm going to ask you very quickly about an issue that's been out there, uh, mandatory masks. We don't have a provincial mandate, but I don't, I don't think most provinces have imposed a mandatory mask rule. We've seen in Alberta, some cities have. What is your thinking on mandatory masks? I think one of the great uh, uh, reckoning you know, of, of the pandemic is, uh, is the lack of uh, leadership, uh, particularly coming from the province, uh, with regard to mandatory mask wearing. Uh, there are two things that needs to be said about this. One is that uh, there has been no leadership uh, around mandatory mask wearing. Uh, and, uh, and where there has been some uh, directives issued, uh, they have been mixed and confusing. Um, so back to uh, why there is no mandatory mask wearing. Uh, as a public health uh, professional, I could not understand uh, this decision. Uh, in August, uh, middle of August, uh, both mayors of Saskatoon and Regina asked the province uh, to make masks mandatory. Uh, and they waited uh, for several weeks, and it was uh, just uh, end of August, uh, early September, that Regina uh, made the decision uh, to pull back their recommendations of mask wearing, and basically to uh, pull. And Saskatoon uh, City uh, decided, uh, made a mandatory mask wearing uh, necessary, mask wearing in transit. Uh, but with a phased in you know, implementation. Um, when rest of the world, it seems to me, it seems to me that we're adapting mask wearing and reams of research was coming out showing that mask wearing protect others from source infection, uh, but also now uh, evidence supporting that it also protects people uh, who is wearing the ma uh, mask as well. Uh, if not actually getting infected, but but from getting a, a very severe case of infection, so the viral load, you know, is 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 reduced uh, when you wear a mask, uh, even if you are exposed to you know this this virus. Uh, uh, so there's uh, there's enough uh, evidence, uh, and other countries have adopted mask wearing. Other cities, Calgary, Edmonton. Uh, Toronto, you know, had adopted mass wearing, and I'm perplexed and deeply disappointed uh, why in my province uh, the leadership was not shown uh, to make this very simple, very effective, and very sensible, <laughs> uh, you know, thing to do uh, at the time of the biggest pandemic we have we have seen in a in hundred years. And uh, Dr. Huang? Sure, so um, I think what we've observed in Saskatchewan with regards to our face mask use um, is a preventive tool to um, limit the spread of COVID-19 is a, in large part a reflection of the guidance that's been provided from the World Health Organizations um, that's adopted by Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, so we saw the evolution of that, whereby we told the public that the face mask work for healthcare worker in healthcare setting um, as a personal protective equipment, yet it will not protect you if you wear it outside of the healthcare setting. And that, I think, did not, um, did not help because that, that created confusion. Um, and I think that makes it much harder when uh, the health of war, health officials um, did a 180 degree turn to say, well, now we think you should be wearing masks uh, because it's going to 
not help you, but help other people. And now we have evidence that says, actually, it will help you, the wearer as well, as helping to reduce the transmission. And I think it's incredibly important that for, for figures of authority, such as physicians or health officials, to admit that if they were wrong at one time, to, to admit that and to, to say, you know, this is um, where things are. Um, at least this is sort of what we've been taught in clinical medicine. You know, if, if you made a medical error, make sure you, 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 you know, let the patient know and, and correct it. Um, and otherwise that trust might be in danger for any future sort of interaction. And I think in this case, um, we're seeing the fallout of that a little bit um, of the mixed messagings of, you know, the role of face masks right from the start. Now, granted, we didn't have as much of the evidence of, you know, whether cloth and fabric homemade face mask could be effective or not at the start. Um, but we have evidence for that now as well, um, coupled with the sort of emerging and newer science um, to inform our understanding of how um, the SARS coronavirus 2 is transmitted, namely, um, you know, mostly through um, us talking, um, even if we don't have any symptoms and they are carried in little um, respiratory secretions called aerosols that, um, you know, may not hit the other person's eyes, nose, or mouth directly, but could be inhaled and breathe in. And so it is in that sense an airborne uh, respiratory pathogens. And the use of mask um, at a population level um, reduce those infectious aerosols from being released into sheer space, um, you know, sheer indoor breathing space, um, you know, without good ventilation, uh, where lots of people congregate, such as school, um, you know, have been shown to be the setting where we see outbreak. And, um, and, and the sort of lack of um, leadership, as Dr. Muhajirin had mentioned earlier, uh, from the province, uh, specifically on mask wearing policy for school reopening, I think it's... This is a disaster for public health um, prevention effort because um, we know that even if you have good science and good evidence, um, a lack of clear communication and lack of clear leadership means that your population, the public, is confused and that breeds dis that breeds distrust. Um, so because we haven't had time, you know, we haven't seen that sort of. Um, mass education, public health education campaign to encourage people to take up these sort of healthful behavior. Um, and, and, and so I think it leaves that mandatory mask, um, you know, being, a, a, being the, the, other, the only other option to, to sort of implement a, a helpful uh, population level intervention. Um, and and I think we 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 could speculate, um, but you know it was a small sample size. But the Angus Reid survey recently did highlight the correlation of um, political ideology um, and mask wearing attitudes, um, and get, and the alignment was that you know people who voted Conservative Party of Canada in the last federal election um, seem to be. Um, Less. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, I just saw something. I so I got. Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, sorry, I got distracted. Well, um, so that um, that correlation of political ideology and mask wearing attitude um, was picked up in this small sample survey, and so, you know, we can speculate, um, and that if that were applicable to the general population, you know, it certainly does show that the politics um, has influenced our face mask uh, policy in this province. 
All right, that's uh, all the time we have this week. I'd like to thank both of my guests. Very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Campaigniacs. Uh, we'll be back next week with more analysis ahead of more analysis ahead of the uh, provincial election. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.